PG&E has become a rogue, criminal corporation. No one's paid the price for what happened to my grandma. But the ratepayers, they're going to pay more. The state of California moved mountains and weakened the law in order to protect the ability of PG&E to make a profit. Governor Newsom has decided that PG&E is going to continue. And so we're going to have to deal with PG&E in our community. And now PG&E is calling all the shots. We did not commit a crime. If you don't hold somebody accountable, they will never be accountable. They will think they can do whatever they want, and they're right. They can. Hello, I'm Brandon Riddiman. As an investigative reporter, I've spent the last four years investigating America's biggest power company, PG&E, the Pacific Gas and Electric Company. For me, that investigation started here, in Paradise, California. November 2018, the campfire. I was there. This may look like nighttime, but we actually filmed this in the middle of the day. We worried people were dying all around us, and sadly, we were right. It was the deadliest wildland fire in California history. We couldn't know it that day, but it was a crime. With the evidence that we had, they were going to be convicted. You're about to meet the prosecutors who convicted PG&E of committing the deadliest homicide by any corporation in the U.S. You'll see new evidence of those crimes only now coming out because it took two years of court battles after PG&E pleaded guilty for us to obtain it all. PG&E's problems continue. It faces four new manslaughter charges in the 2020 Zog fire. All of it raises the unavoidable question. What is your government doing about PG&E? I think there's been a lot of enabling going on in, in Sacramento. This is Exhibit A. It's a piece of paper from California state government officially certifying PG&E as a safe utility. This was created by a new state law pushed and then signed by Governor Gavin Newsom. We've explained before how that law gives PG&E this safety certificate, regardless of whether PG&E actually is safe. Our investigation also revealed something else Californians need to know about that law, who the governor's office hired to write it. Passing this state law that saved PG&E never made much sense to some of the people hurt by the company's crimes. It's completely a farce. That law makes even less sense to Steve Bradley now, after our latest findings about who helped make it. I wish I could come up with a better metaphor for the shenanigans that are going on. You know, it's, you know, it's almost like the bank robbers union designing the bank safes. The law, known as AB 1054, affects what millions of Californians pay each month on their power bills. And it was created in response to a crime, not a bank robbery. It was a mass homicide, the campfire, the one that destroyed the town of Paradise in 2018. PG&E pleaded guilty to the manslaughter of 84 people, including Steve's grandma. That's going on. PG&E recklessly started that fire. This is the hook that killed 84 people. By putting profits over safety. In a word, greed. They didn't want to spend the money to actually replace these things. While prosecutors built that case, PG&E filed for bankruptcy in 2019. Not to go out of business, but to protect itself and stay in business. That same month, a new governor took office. You gotta give these folks a chance. PG&E was already on a second chance. The corporation was on federal probation for crimes tied to the deadly San Bruno gas explosion. Despite PG&E's status as a convicted felon, Newsom accepted its campaign money. So did eight out of 10 members of the state legislature from both parties. Then, when PG&E declared it couldn't afford to pay for the tens of billions of dollars in wildfire damage it had caused, those elected leaders came to PG&E's rescue. We all have a burden and responsibility to assume the costs. Governor Newsom's office hired private attorneys who crafted the bill that would become AB 1054. 
The law created new safety certificates for utility companies to apply for. The certificate protects PG&E shareholders from having to pay for fire damage. It makes it harder to hold the utility accountable. This is going to sound weird, but I feel more helpless now than I did on the day of the fire. PG&E applied right away and quickly got its first safety certificate. Two months later, this happened. The October 2019 Kincaid fire. You know, it's not like the governor signed some magical document that fixed PG&E's infrastructure. It's gone on like this. Kincaid, Zog, which killed four people, and Dixie. Every fire season, state investigators find probable cause PG&E committed more reckless arson. And every year, the state awards PG&E a new safety certificate anyway. It's fair to ask, who crafted the law that keeps enabling that to happen? During the hearings on AB 1054, some lawmakers did ask, by name, about the private attorneys the governor's office hired to write it. It's my understanding that uh, the governor's office, largely through the work of uh, attorneys with O'Melveny and Myers and uh, Guggenheim investors, uh, basically wrote this bill. Governor Newsom's cabinet secretary sidestepped that question. The administration with our advisors worked closely with uh, the authors and legislative staff in developing the legislation. But he was right. These early draft versions of AB 1054 were sent by attorneys at that firm, O'Melveny and Myers. Governor Gavin Newsom's office awarded O'Melveny a contract that paid at least $9.6 million of taxpayer money to help him handle PG&E's bankruptcy. Newsom didn't hide that. He talked up O'Melveny's qualifications. They are experts in energy. But the governor failed to mention where some of that expertise came from. We found that before it worked for the state, O'Melveny worked for PG&E. PG&E filed these documents five months before the campfire. They list O'Melveny as one of PG&E's law firms. So PG&E's lawyers wrote the law that allowed them to get away with murder. The list showed O'Melveny working for PG&E as recently as 2017, the year before the campfire. But we found O'Melveny's legal work for PG&E goes back at least two decades. O'Melveny represented both PG&E's electric and gas businesses. I would love for someone from the governor's office to be able to explain all this. We've been asking. How can you assure those people, including the fire victims, that your office can act neutrally considering that PG&E donated more than $208,000 to help you get elected? There's, there's no, I know this is a mantra, and I don't know how many times I've answered this question. I would encourage you to go back to all my previous answers. I, if the suggestion is somehow I'm influenced by that, you're wrong. Newsom's office declined our request for an interview. In response to our emails about his hiring of O'Melveny and Myers, the governor's spokesperson wrote, the firm you're referring to did not represent PG&E when it worked for the state of California on this matter. It still looks bad. You know, they still have a law firm that previously represented PG&E, now representing the state. They're treating PG&E like another office of the governor. Assemblymember Chris Holden, the sponsor of AB 1054, booked an interview with us. Then his office canceled with no explanation. They ignored our request to reschedule, so we found him at the Capitol. Were you aware that O'Melveny and Myers had pg &E as a client the year before the campfire? Uh, no, not to my, not to my recollection. I mean, I've talked to the family members of some of the people who died up in Paradise say this doesn't pass the smell test. To them, this is pg and &E lawyers writing the bill that saved pg and &E business. Well, I don't, I don't agree with that. I mean, I can't disagree with their, their feelings and how they uh, view it. And they have every right to view it in the way that they are. Yeah. But this was not something that uh, PG&E uh, designed. A spokesperson for O'Melveny told us it didn't have an obligation to disclose its past work for PG&E before representing the governor in PG&E's bankruptcy. The firm wouldn't say whether it did disclose that information. The governor's office and PG&E wouldn't tell us whether that was discussed either. They think they knew exactly what they were doing. Former prosecutor Mike Aguirre represents PG&E customers suing against AB 1054. He obtained these calendar entries from the governor's office, meetings back when the safety certificate law was being written behind closed doors. The governor was holding a series of secret meetings, some of which included Melvin and Myers, with PG&E 
to do what PG&E was asking them to do, which is to relieve PG&E from any legal responsibility for past and future fires. Newsom's spokesperson told us the lawyers involved had nothing to do with any prior representation of PG&E. PG&E wouldn't give us a list, though, of the specific O'Melveny attorneys who represented them. PG&E spokesperson Lindsay Palo would only say there was no conflict of interest or even the appearance of a conflict of interest. It appears like there is to me. Aguirre sees the conflict this way. Imagine the state had come down harshly on PG&E. You can bet the company would have complained that its own lawyers were involved. You don't hire a pro-corporate law firm when you need a pro-victim uh, solution. That's really what it boils down to. It has to be corruption. But if they were bumbling politicians that didn't understand what they were fully doing, they wouldn't be able to do what they're doing. We think it's important to hold these uh, utilities accountable. Then why are they getting safety certificates every year? Well, I mean, I can't explain. I'm, I'm not part of doing the, the investigations and, the, and, and issuing the certificates. There's a tree on the line started a fire. When PG&E sparked the massive Dixie fire in 2021, the company had a safety certificate that O'Melveny and Myers helped create, a certificate that lets PG&E cover the wildfire damage out of a fund you pay into on your power bill. PG&E is planning to take $150 million out of that wildfire fund for the Dixie fire. If there was wrongdoing, should they get it? We're going to come back to the Dixie Fire and how the state's handling of PG&E influenced the outcome of that criminal investigation. But first... It wasn't just an accident. The evidence that proved PG&E committed crimes by starting California's deadliest wildfire. See how easily you can see that? Evidence we spent two years fighting in court to bring you. Secrets of the Campfire, revealed when we come back. Welcome back to Firepower Money. After PG&E pleaded guilty to killing 84 people in and around Paradise, we wanted to know the details of the case. But before we could see those records, California's courts made all of them secret. After two years of court battles in which we argued for the public's right to know, we can finally show you the secrets of the campfire. They don't feel guilty, they don't act guilty. They're certainly not being held accountable like they're guilty. The Pacific Gas and Electric Company is guilty. Guilty of felony charges for destroying Steve Bradley's hometown, Paradise, California. When PG&E recklessly started the campfire in November of 2018, more than 30,000 people lost their homes. Many lost their lives. Steve's grandma, Colleen Riggs. No one's paid the price for what happened to my grandma, but the ratepayers, they're gonna pay more. Julian Binstock. The justice I want for my father, I will never see. They pled guilty and at that point, everything they did should have come out. It didn't all come out. PG&E pleaded guilty to the mass manslaughter of 84 people, but there was no trial. With the evidence that we had, they were gonna be convicted. That evidence, the case against PG&E, came together here in secret. Dozens of PG&E employees came here to testify under oath in front of a grand jury. The transcript of their answers fills thousands of pages. The grand jury voted to indict PG&E on all counts. Ordinarily, that would make all the pages public within 10 days under California law. Instead, the entire record was sealed because of a lawsuit paid for by PG&E. PG&E doesn't want the general public knowing that their culture is really anti-safety and pro-profits. ABC 10 argued to the court for the public's right to know. The Wall Street Journal joined us. Prosecutors fought to unseal their case, the case they'd already won. I think it's, it's vitally important that people know who did what when? 
It's taken two years, but we finally have the documents. More than 40 volumes, one for each day of testimony in the case. Huge victory. The guilty party should never be able to hide their crimes. Our team scoured through the 5,300 pages of testimony to bring you this story. Together with evidence we've obtained from years of public records requests and hours of interviews with investigators, insiders, and experts, we're about to reveal the crime behind California's deadliest wildfire, as it's never been seen before. After sparking the campfire, PG&E said it was fully cooperating with all investigations. The lead prosecutor begs to differ. Every single one of our employees and every former PG&E employee that is alive on the planet Earth is represented by counsel. You can't talk to them. To protect against the criminal probe, PG&E paid for more than just its own legal defense. The company hired lawyers for key witnesses in the case, its current and former employees. This spilled into view during questions about the century-old Caribou Palermo power line, the one that sparked the campfire. One PG&E worker who used to inspect it stopped taking questions, the pages show. Troubleman Buck Arden pulled a note out of his pocket and invoked the Fifth Amendment his right not to incriminate himself on advice of his PG&E funded lawyer. Yeah, I, I, I don't blame the inspector that's out there that isn't trained. That's not his fault. Prosecutors felt the same way. They weren't after line level employees. They wanted the Troubleman's answers to go after PG&E and its leaders. In a hearing that remains secret, Judge Michael Deems granted something called use immunity. The troubleman had to talk, but his answers could only be used to prosecute the company, not him. Almost all the PG&E workers got this deal to testify. Every day we fought PG&E, Arden told the jurors after getting his immunity. I've been fired once already for fighting them. His inspections of that power line? I wrote up everything that I saw that I could possibly physically write up. Everything else is out of my hands. I mean, I can only do so much. That wasn't enough for prosecutors. They knew PG&E missed glaring safety problems. Why, if we can see this, couldn't you? When we come back. If you never change the tires, you're gonna get a flat. How easily PG&E could have prevented the campfire and why the company didn't. This now infamous sea hook, the one that dropped the live wire and sparked the campfire, it snapped after 97 years of grinding away in the elements. And you found those up and down this line? Oh yeah, we found it all over the line. The DA and Cal Fire found more hooks like it on the verge of breaking. Some had grooves two thirds of the way through. These photos, taken from the Butte County Sheriff's helicopter, have never been shown to the public before. They reveal how the DA found this danger. Danger PG&E missed. See how easily you can see that? It wasn't hard. Investigators figured out all they needed to do was look at the tops of the hooks. This space between the top of the hole and the top of the hook is what we started describing as a moon. A thin thumbnail moon like this one meant the hook was still good. But when that space grew into a half moon, it meant the hooks and holes had worn into each other. The more moon you see, the more wear there is. Using a digital camera you can buy at Walmart, the investigation team taught itself how to do more effective inspections than PG&E. PG&E's people thought it couldn't be done, according to the transcripts. You would have to be at the exact angle, Troubleman Jeff Sharp testified. It would be a hazardous position for yourself and the helicopter. Okay, but obviously this photograph is taken from a helicopter. It was? Yep. That photograph was taken by a law enforcement officer who has no training, no experience. But he, he knew he wanted to take a picture of that. That's the problem, prosecutors argue. How come PG&E didn't want pictures of that? They had a theory. Because if you find it, you have to fix it. And to fix it costs money. If you never change the tires, you're going to get a flat. The inspections and patrols that PG&E was doing were not designed to actually find these problems. 
PG&E's inspectors testified they didn't know they needed to look for worn hooks. Didn't know that they existed, Sharp confirmed. There's no training on that, said fellow troubleman Jeff Simmons. I had not ever heard of a sea hook failing, Darren Clark added. He didn't even know they could break. Damning answers for the company, because PG&E and its leaders did know. The grand jury saw proof. PG&E's own studies on worn hooks and eye holes, going back as early as 1987 and as recently as 2018 on this Bay Area transmission line. That's where PG&E found these holes worn out by hooks. Seven months later, this came out of the campfire. Looks very similar, the material and the pattern of wear, said Peter Martin, the PG&E scientist who authored the 2018 study. He concluded the parts would wear through when they got to be about 97 to 100 years old. But the workers actually inspecting 97-year-old power lines up in Butte County never got those findings, they testified. Did PG&E's leaders take any action after the study? No, said David Hernandez, the supervisor who ordered it. Not that he knew. Those are the people that are trying to do the right thing. The problem in PG&E's culture is that those people are not appreciated and rewarded. And that's where the whole system of bonuses comes in. Still ahead. What price is human life? We follow the money behind PG&E's crimes and learn who at the top knew what. PG&E's line-level employees were trying to do the right thing, but the campfire prosecutors found PG&E didn't reward people for doing the right thing. It rewarded people who came in under budget. And that's where the whole system of bonuses comes in. Looking at PG&E's bonuses, investigators found these, what insiders called red-green reports. Red is bad, green is good, said Joe Little, who supervised the Caribou Palermo line. The numbers tracked inspection costs every month. Yes, PG&E used this to set employee bonuses, he confirmed. They incentivized not taking proper care of their equipment financially. So what, what price, what price is human life? Prosecutors found PG&E cut the number of inspections and the time allowed to do them. They only give you X amount of time, Arden testified. They don't like you running the jobs over. This is the kind of constant pressure that's being put on the, the people who are actually doing the work by the financial people. PG&E used to give the Caribou Palermo line three scheduled inspections a year. But in the 1990s, PG&E started making cuts. By the time of the campfire, four out of five years, the power line only got one so-called air patrol. That's not a patrol, that's a flyby, said Chuck Stinnett. Decades ago, he flew inspections low and slow for the company to really look at the hundreds of parts on every tower. But in more recent years, oh gosh, I mean, it's realistically, it's seconds to look at each tower, confirmed Simmons. Flight plans backed it up, showing PG&E plans to look at almost 1,700 towers in a six-hour shift. That's less than 13 seconds to fly past each tower. I don't know how to respond, Stinnett said. I'm devastated by the information that I see. We had already established that the inspection and patrol policies were garbage. So if you're putting garbage in, you are going to get garbage out. The garbage out, he says, was PG&E's five-year plans for which old power lines needed to be replaced. The people making those plans, like David Gabbard, didn't have good data about the power lines or their parts. As PG&E's senior director of transmission asset management, Gabbard testified he didn't know that PG&E had 100-year-old parts still hanging in towers. Mr. Gabbard was, was the first mate on the Titanic and uh, was handed the steering wheel just as the iceberg was ripping in. Gabbard was among the most senior PG&E people to testify. He did say he knew PG&E had prominent risks of wildfire from deteriorated and dilapidated infrastructure, and he confirmed personally telling that to the people at the top. Your direct supervisor, Kevin Dasso? Yes. His direct supervisor, Patrick Hogan? Yes. President and CEO, Geisha Williams? Yes. Why are those people not in prison? This was not an accident. This was murder by omission. Those executives never testified. Prosecutors weren't willing to give them any immunity. You got 
all these people high up the food chain, mm -hmm. you know, and, and you've got witnesses saying they knew about this, essentially. So how come they're not in jail? Because we ran out of time. By law, grand jury investigations are limited to one year. Even if they'd had more time, prosecutors aren't sure they could have developed the evidence needed to convict executives. But they felt it was important to call the campfire what it was, crime. And it wasn't just an accident. It wasn't just a simple negligence. It was an entire corporation failing for years and years and years and just rotting from the inside and not caring. All pg and learned from its history is how to better conceal its crimes in the future. No one went to prison for the campfire. As its sentence, pg and &E paid the maximum three and a half million dollar fine, pocket change compared to its annual revenue. pg and &E says it's making itself safer. It did change many of the strategies we just went over, but there's a saying in business, culture eats strategy for breakfast. They're not held accountable well, the culture works. Everybody's happy and, you know, everybody's making money. CEO Geisha Williams left after the fire. John Simon took over a while. He's still PG&E's top lawyer. The next CEO, Bill Johnson, pleaded guilty 85 times on PG&E's behalf. A different Bill, Bill Smith, took over the next day as interim CEO. We won't see you back at one of these? No, sir. Just three months after he said that, the Zog fire killed four people. PG&E faces four new felony manslaughter charges. Smith is still on PG&E's board, but he's been replaced as CEO by Patty Poppy. We did not commit a crime. She put out this video statement denying the manslaughter charges, but skipped the court date. PG&E sent a team to Shasta County who pleaded not guilty to the Zog fire without her. Poppy has insisted that this time, PG&E's culture really is changing. She's seen our investigations. The ABC 10 news series. But has only ever offered to speak with us off the record, which we've declined to do. Poppy has appeared elsewhere, but over the past year and a half, her PR team has repeatedly declined our requests for interviews. PG&E claims that they're a changing organization. Well, let's, uh, let's walk the talk. Has the conviction meant as much as you had hoped? I'd be dis uh, uh, disingenuous to say that, uh, oh boy, well, we, we got our victory and all is good. No, uh, but I believe all is much better. DA Mike Ramsey says the company has taken positive steps, but he worries about how deep PG&E's problem is. The company hasn't gone a full year without sparking a big destructive fire since 2016. That'll just be in the proof of the pudding as we see, you know, come this November, quite frankly. I think there's been a lot of enabling going on in, in Sacramento. Lead prosecutor Mark Knoll worries PG&E won't change without the state government forcing the company's leaders to take accountability. But our investigation showed the legislature and Governor Gavin Newsom acted to protect PG&E from the consequences of starting fires. Unless things change, many more acres are going to be destroyed. Many more homes are going to be lost. And more importantly, many more deaths are going to occur. Paradise should have shocked the conscience of the state, of our governor. It should have shocked the conscience of all of PG&E's executives. And it, it didn't. And it won't. That's why I talk to you, is because maybe they'll see it. And they'll realize the hurt that they caused and continue to cause. And they'll see me and they'll say, maybe we can do this. It took us hiring lawyers and spending thousands of dollars in fees to get these records. Nobody in the public, certainly not the people who survived the campfire, should have to do that. So if you point your phone's camera at this code, you'll be taken to this story online, where you can actually download all 5,000 pages and read them for yourself. 
For me, this story drives home why transparency matters. I can't quantify the harm done by keeping all these details secret for two critical years during a time when the public, activists, and government were all trying to respond to PG&E's behavior. But I do know that there can be no accountability without the truth, without the facts. And that's why we opted to make all of this critical information available for free to everyone. From California's deadliest fire, we're going to the state's single biggest fire. The Dixie Fire burned almost a million acres and half of a national park in 2021. Did climate change start this fire? No. Did forest management start this fire? No. What did start this fire? PG&E. PG&E started the Dixie Fire, but this time, prosecutors didn't get their conviction. It, it, it's a game. Like For me, it feels just like a game, and it's all about money. And it's all about power. How PG&E started the Dixie Fire when we come back. Welcome back to Firepower Money. We opened with how the state government responded to PG&E's crimes by changing the law to make it easier for utilities to escape accountability for damage caused when they spark wildfires. In the past year, we saw that translate into real benefits for PG&E. District attorneys in six California counties dropped criminal cases against PG&E, opting for civil settlements instead. One of those was about the Kincaid fire, sparked by this PG&E transmission line in 2019, the year after the campfire. Explaining why she settled instead of moving ahead with charges, Sonoma County DA Jill Ravitch said the state attorney general was no help. And she pointed to the governor's push to bail PG&E out. I mean, if I had a magic wand and I could wave it, maybe PG&E wouldn't exist anymore, right? But Governor Newsom has decided that PG&E is going to continue. And so we're going to have to deal with PG&E in our community. That same day, five other DAs, including the one who convicted PG&E of the campfire, settled another one, the largest single fire in state history, which PG&E started in 2021. For that, we go to the small mountain town of Greenville. What's left of it? They had advance warning. Everyone in Greenville survived, but their lives as shopkeepers, teachers, plumbers, and artists? The Dixie Fire wiped those away with the town. I think that's the deepest trauma, is like, who am I now? And I think, that's, I think a lot of people are struggling with that. Sue Weber sees the struggle up close, working in the aftermath. A lot of our elderly are passing away. And I think it's because for them, it's overwhelming. The Dixie Fire destroyed an area the size of Rhode Island, almost a million acres, Canyon Dam, Indian Falls, half of Lassen Volcanic National Park. But it was Greenville that got the politicians spinning. We lost Greenville tonight, and there's just not words for how us and government haven't been able to get the job done. That's Congressman Doug LaMalfa, a Republican. He pointed to poor forest management as the problem behind this fire when he came up here. Governor Gavin Newsom, a Democrat, also came up. He pointed to something else. These are climate-induced wildfires. But neither politician from either side of the aisle pointed to what did cause this fire, a corporation that donated to both of their campaigns. Did climate change start this fire? No. Did forest management start this fire? No. What did start this fire? pg and For the tree that was on the line, there's a tree on the line, started a fire. This 65 foot tall Douglas fir should have been discovered and removed by pg and &E, according to CAL FIRE. Investigators found the trunk was so rotten, it couldn't support the tree's weight. The tree grew into line or it fell into the line? No, it fell, fell into the line. Butte County prosecutors say the problem was obvious. This is not too far off from where, from the tree that started the Dixie fire. The side of the trunk facing the power lines had a big section of bark missing. It'd been that way since 2008, an examination of tree rings showed. PG&E had 13 years to catch this problem, but never did. Why did you not see this tree? Investigators say PG&E also acted with negligence the day the tree broke, failing to take the problem seriously. 
that tree was cooking and cooking for, for 10 hours in a very, very dangerous area. PG&E's computers flagged trouble at 6.48 a.m., presumably the time the tree fell. But it took almost 10 hours for a PG&E employee to finally get there. When troubleman Scott Campbell arrived, he said he noticed the tree and a small fire, the first flames of the Dixie Fire. The troubleman's lawyers point out he risked his own safety trying to put it out. Prosecutors didn't charge Campbell. They say PG&E set him up to fail. It took PG&E about four hours to even give the job to Campbell. Before that, PG&E had assigned it to the wrong maintenance yard. They basically wasted about three and a half hours doing nothing. Others at PG&E could have prevented this fire that day. 94 miles away in this unmarked PG&E building, operators thought about turning off the power but decided not to. If they had gotten up there earlier, if they had used any of the tools that were available to them, or just simply cutting off the power to that section of the line until they could get there, there would have been no fire. So how many times does it have to happen? The year before Dixie, PG&E pleaded guilty to crimes for sparking the campfire. PG&E's criminal neglect of a power line killed people in and around Paradise. Campfire, we put our foot down because that's different. That's people died. You can't just have a civil settlement. PG&E pleaded guilty to 84 manslaughters. Making PG&E a felon, a killer. The Dixie Fire sparked just up the highway in the same canyon. Butte County District Attorney Mike Ramsey says his team could have proved PG&E guilty again. There's value in calling a crime a crime. Correct. That and was the thing you had to give up this time. At this point, yes. He and the DAs of the other four counties that burned allowed PG&E to settle the Dixie Fire in civil court. No admission of criminal wrongdoing. In exchange, PG&E agreed to pay damages more quickly to the people whose homes burned down. Get money back into that community. The DAs say they wanted to avoid a repeat of the campfire, where PG&E's crime victims are still waiting for payment almost four years later. But this is super cool. I'm super stoked for this. <laughs> Sue Weber is glad for any money that'll help Greenville rebuild. The nonprofit collaborative she helps run got $3 million in the deal. But it still doesn't feel right. It's, it, it, it's a game. It, like For me, it feels just like a game. And it's all about money. And it's all about power. If they had convicted pg &E of crimes in the Dixie Fire, prosecutors say the punishment would have only been less than $330,000. After Paradise, when pg &E paid a fine of only $10,000 per manslaughter victim, prosecutors called on state lawmakers to pass tougher penalties for companies. The ball's in their court at this point. Lead campfire prosecutor Mark Knoll says he's not even sure bigger fines would be enough. He wants the ability to jail PG&E executives if they don't keep their safety promises. To me, that's the only real thing that's going to stop this, is if the people who are making the decisions of PG&E have consequences. But our investigation found the legislature passed laws to protect PG&E, not punish it. They created a multi-billion dollar insurance program, which PG&E plans to use for the Dixie Fire. We revealed the bill to create that insurance was written by lawyers working for Governor Gavin Newsom's office, a law firm that used to represent PG&E. The laws are not made for the average American. Despite its 91 felonies and sparking more fires every year, PG&E remains free and it remains in power. If you don't hold somebody accountable, they will never be accountable. They will think they can do whatever they want, and they're right. They can. We've reached out time and again to PG&E for interviews with their CEO, but she continues to decline. However, the woman who used to be PG&E's top state regulator did agree to talk. PG&E has absolutely no incentive to clean up its act. 
because it got some get out of jail free cards. With PG&E facing new homicide charges in one fire and a federal criminal investigation in another, she'll explain the stakes and why it matters not just to victims, but to everyone who pays a power bill. Welcome back to Firepower Money. We've just taken you inside the fraught world of criminal accountability for PG&E. So what now? Where does the government's enabling of PG&E leave the rest of us? And what does it mean for everyone who pays their power bill? PG&E has become a rogue criminal corporation that acts only for itself and always tries to increase its profits and wring every penny it can out of its customers. Loretta Lynch used to be PG&E's top state regulator, leading the California Public Utilities Commission. She was CPUC president in the early 2000s. No one is holding PG&E to account. If we don't have real consequences for PG&E's criminal actions, then PG&E will never change, and we, Californians, will always be at risk Part of the thing that keeps me up at night after investigating this for four years is the question of how big of a thing will they have to burn down in order to actually generate accountability. You know, that's what I thought after San Bruno. This gas pipeline ruptured in San Bruno. The explosion and fire killed eight people. PG&E was convicted of six felony charges. While on federal probation for its San Bruno crimes, PG&E started the campfire pleading guilty to more crimes. Well, now, surely, the PUC and the legislature and the governor will hold PG&E to account. And very sadly, that didn't happen. The federal judge in charge of PG&E's criminal probation for the gas explosion started to demand answers about power lines. Lynch had left the CPUC before San Bruno, but she says the probation was a golden opportunity for her former agency to get some help forcing PG&E to change. I was astonished, however, that the California Public Utilities Commission would come into Judge Alsup's court and argue for lower standards. What the PUC said was, Judge, what you're ordering is just way too hard for little PG&E to have to deal with. Let them do what we've ordered, which is a whole lot less. So the PUC was advocating on PG&E's behalf. PG&E's probation under federal judge William Alsup expired in early 2022, even though the company went on a crime spree in his words. He said PG&E will emerge from probation as a continuing menace to California. PG&E didn't comment when we asked them to respond to that. And the judge called them a rogue corporation because that's what they are, because the PUC is not doing its job and Sacramento isn't making it do its job. So. PG&E has a problem, it's criminal, and the state is playing enabler. Absolutely. The state of California moved mountains and weakened the law in order to protect the ability of PG&E to make a profit as a for-profit corporation. The CPUC didn't respond to our request for comment. Lynch was disappointed to see local DAs settle the Dixie and Kincaid fires this past year without criminal charges. But Shasta County is still moving ahead with four new charges of manslaughter in the 2020 Zog fire. No one should have to go through that. No one. Zach McLeod's wife and their eight-year-old daughter are among the four people killed. PG&E pleaded not guilty to four counts of manslaughter and other charges. The preliminary hearing is set for January 2023. Lynch says the outcome matters beyond justice for the victims because of AB 1054, Governor Newsom's safety certificate law. Now, if they cause a wildfire, the customers pay for the damages and not the utilities. So it's this golden ticket. Whatever they do, unless essentially they're criminally negligent, is going to be paid for by their customers. Because PG&E wasn't held criminally liable for the thousand or so homes destroyed in the Dixie fire, those civil damages could cost customers. <laughs> Meantime, PG&E fell under yet another criminal investigation in the past year, the Mosquito Fire. Arson investigators from the U.S. Forest Service seized parts of this PG&E transmission line where the fire started. If it was caused by PG&E, it would be the sixth year in a row the company started a large fire that destroyed homes. 
You can be the first to know when new firepower money investigations are ready. Get out your phone and start a text to 916-321-3310. Again, that's 916-321-3310. All you have to do is text us the letters F p.m. We'll add you to our text list for news stories and major updates. Over the past four years, we've shown how PG&E's state regulators at the California Public Utilities Commission repeatedly let PG&E off the hook, affecting not only fire survivors, but your power bill too. We've revealed problems with the health of our forests amid a changing climate and looked into the solutions. You can watch all of it now at firepowermoney.com or by installing the ABC10 app on your Roku or Fire TV. We live here, we're local journalists. If you appreciate our in-depth coverage, share Firepower Money with your friends. We can expect more preventable fires that do even more damage as long as California hasn't figured out how to get its arms around the three core elements of the crisis. Fire, power, money. I'm Brandon Ritterman. Thanks for watching.